I'm working with groups of people that aren't just engineers and scientists. They include social scientists mm -hmm. and anthropologists uh, and, and uh, in, behind the scenes on this UAP issue. To go ahead and take your question about where do I want to bring my uh, oceanographic expertise. So uh, because I have that, I have years of experience in that field, it just makes sense for me to look at it from that angle and focus on that uh, maritime undersea domain. Because we know these objects from multiple reports have exhibited transmedium uh, movement, and 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 I'm I've received reports from people and of, of occurrences undersea. So you can call them undersea UAP or what have you, and uh, or USOs. That's the term of art. I think people use a lot too. Un unidentified submerged objects. Mm -hmm. And so we, there's not much out there. And and what I am proposing to do because of my position on two. Uh, uh, notable ocean-related uh, bodies as that uh, is to increase the scientific study of them. Welcome to Merge. I'm Ryan Graves. Today we're joined by retired Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet. Uh, Tim serves on the advisory board at Americans for Safe Aerospace, uh, as well as actively involved in the Galileo Project. Thanks for joining me today, Tim. It's great to be here, Ryan. Uh, it's an honor for me uh, to have you join me here. Um, we have some interesting um, coincidental experiences in the Navy that we'll talk about later that involve UAP. But first, let's just start with why you joined the Navy. Ah, well, sure. Uh, my focus in most of life has been the ocean. I have a degree in oceanography, and my love for that came from growing up in Southern California and going to the beach, surfing, swimming. I, I competed in swimming, and, and so... Just that is why I decided to go into the Navy because the Naval Academy had an oceanographic major. And back in 1985, uh, when I entered, there weren't many colleges or universities that had a good marine science program. So to be honest with you, as, as much as I, I love the Navy, I really went to become an oceanographer first, and, and the Navy thing kind of grew on me. Very cool. Did you find that a lot of people, when you went to the Naval Academy, that you said you went to the Naval Academy? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, were there other, um, other of your um, classmates there that kind of had a similar passion for, for, um, for, I guess, the ocean, underwater environment? You know, so the, from my perspective, you know, I was in the Navy as well, as, as you're aware, but yeah. a totally different kind of um, cohort where I was focused on flying, and yeah. that was really my passion. And I, you know, frankly, wasn't super interested in the dynamics of oceanography and things sure. of that nature. It just was outside of my wheelhouse. Right, right. Um, was, was I the exception, or was everyone kind of just no, focused no, on their own No, you were the norm, because I recall when I graduated, Top Gun was still relatively recent, you mm. know, the movie. And the I, first I, one. Yeah, the first one, <laughs> exactly. And uh, I, a large number of my classmates were motivated by Top Gun, came into the academy wanting to be pilots. Mm -hmm. and, and that's all good, so I'd say I was really the exception. And even though there were a few in my major who really loved oceanography, um, there weren't many that went and did that in their entire career. It's just a really small community in the mm -hmm. Navy. Let's talk about that. What did that look like after you graduated? Oh, I had a blast. I, it, it's really everything I wanted to do. The Navy sent me to graduate school twice at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and then I worked on a hydrographic survey ship making uh, nautical charts in the Arabian Gulf right after the first Gulf War and the Arabian Sea. And we uh, uh, Then I, I served on a couple of uh, um, helicopter carriers and aircraft carriers. So doing meteorology for on that side of, of okay. the house, you know. So the me oceanography profession does all environmental things, you know, charting the seafloor, doing some uh, oceanographic analysis for anti-submarine warfare, and then a lot of meteorology, as you know. My last job was a chief meteorologist of the Navy, and, and that's why I'm on your advisory board, because I really believe in your, your campaign to uh, make aviation more safe. So I've all, you know, I always hear, 99 or some large number of percent of uh, under the sea is unmapped or unexplored in some sense. I, I, you know, the Navy, I'm sure, has been mapping it for a number of years. How close is that anecdotal, you know, number you hear about it being mostly unexplored? How true is that? It's very true. It was one of my top priorities when I was leading NOAA to map more of our seafloor and, and explore more of our oceans. In fact, we, the world's oceans, not even barely 5% of, of the volume has been explored. So there's that much of the ocean we don't know anything about. And in the seafloor, much less than 50% have been, has been mapped to modern standards with a high-resolution multi-beam sonar. 
And that's pretty incredible when you think about it. it we have mapped the surface of Mars and the Moon to a higher fidelity than, than we have the world's seafloor. Hmm. And so there, and, and at, when I was at NOAA and in the Navy, we were discovering new features, uh, uncharted sea mounts that were hazards to submarine navigation, for example. We had two, two submarines in the last 20 years uh, run into sea mounts. And, 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 and mountains, you're saying, sea yeah, mountains. Under yeah, under sea mountains, yeah. that's right. That, we just didn't know, they were didn't uncharted. Didn't know they were, they were uncharted, yeah. That's right. They weren't so, new, right? I mean, well, no, they, they weren't, yeah, they weren't new. Yeah, they had not new just volcanic like, activity or something. Yeah, it wasn't like that, like, mm -hmm. like the Tonga, you know, Earth thing that uh, went, went off that eruption, and kind of a new island formed. But um, yeah, so that, that was an, that's an interesting thing when you think about it. We at NOAA were discovering new species every year. And, and it wasn't just like little, you know, mi microbiology specimens. We even discovered a new species of killer whale in Antarctica. That's fascinating. Y yeah, it's incredible so, to think so about it. Can you, can you talk, I know we're jumping a little bit, but I think there's a great point. What is NOAA's scientific charter, if they have one? Do they have responsibility for any type of pure scientific work, or is all their effort based off of some need of the government that they're looking to fulfill, such as a better understanding of undersea mountains, for example, so our submarines don't hit them. Right. Well, NOAA has a really broad charter, and it's it's all codified in a number of pieces of legislation. And uh, but it really the the scope of their environmental science and stewardship mission ranges from the deepest parts of the sea to the surface of the sun. Mm -hmm. They do space weather, atmospheric weather prediction and data collection and research oceanographic data collection and research and prediction, fisheries management and fishery science, which is really complicated. If anybody who's a fisherman out there will know. And, uh, and then really interesting things um, with respect to ecology and ecosystems and wetlands. So really, they're, they're the nation's top agency for anything environmental. The Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, they're regulators, but NOAA is the environmental science agency for its ocean, climate, weather. Got it. So I suppose if NOAA was doing a survey of the underwater environment and they came across a new shipwreck that perhaps had had a lot of value and people have been searching for, um, what would limit their obligation to communicate that as a discovery? Oh, there's no limit. It's their charter, really, their mission to communicate that, and we did it often. I was When I was at, with the agency, we discovered new shipwrecks. In addition, one of my favorite parts of NOAA are these things called the National Marine Sanctuaries, which are basically like the national parks, but underwater. Mm -hmm. And some of them, in the Great Lakes, for example, their main mission is to preserve uh, shipwrecks. And there's one called Thunder Bay in Lake Huron. Uh, that National Marine Sanctuary has all these really old sh wooden shipwrecks mm -hmm. that are preserved in the fresh water. I've been scuba diving on them. And it's a, it's a really neat maritime heritage mission. So really broad scope for, for NOAA. I mean, I just enjoyed every bit of it. Are there data sets that could no, I don't want to jump into the UAP topic too quickly here, yeah. but you know, part of where I'm kind of going with this is if they are mapping the underwater environment and they do have this scientific charter, um, maybe they're not looking for something that might be interesting to other scientific groups. Are there any procedures or processes in place for petitioning NOAA to evaluate for certain characteristics, say, under, under sea, that might be of interest to a particular group versus another group? Well, so there's a number of offices at NOAA that do ocean research and and one uh, office in particular is strictly for exploration mm. and and they, they don't have a, any limits so they, I mean they have limits on the capacity because they have one ship uh, the Okeanos Explorer with a deep diving ROV and they use a remotely operated vehicle tethered to the ship and they all that has cameras and sonars and and does the data collection and exploration of the ocean volume, and it has sonar, so it's doing some exploration of the ocean seafloor. And, uh, and then uh, that, that office also, and it was one of my favorite offices, uh, they work with partners. For example, Robert Ballard, the discoverer of the Titanic, and my good friend, he has a ship that NOAA funds, and uh, it's called the uh, Exploration Vessel Nautilus, and he does the same mission in different places. You know, the ocean's big, so we need a couple. And then there's other institutes that NOAA funds for that purpose too. One's called the Schmidt uh, Institute, run by Eric and, uh, or owned by Eric and, and Wendy Schmidt. And, and then there's so, several other partners that have ships with ROVs. So it's a, it's a big ocean, not much, there's a lot still we wanna learn about it. And so there's all these different assets that NOAA is using. And they're, they're, the things they're going after range from shipwrecks, geology, biology, the oceanographic conditions, the chemistry and the, and the physics. It's, uh, it's really exciting. And that, that, that was because of my background. That was one of my favorite offices to work with 
funny thing. Uh, so Robert Ballard, very famous uh, oceanographer, was, was in the Navy, a naval oceanographer. My inspiration to join the Navy and become an oceanographer, when, uh, when I was a midshipman, he gave a lecture uh, at the Naval Academy uh, just less than a year after he first discovered Titanic. Hmm. And, wow. um, and, of course, I was smitten. I, I, I knew I wanted to be him. So I followed that path, and then at some point in the Navy, I started working with him uh, when I was a captain, and we stayed close. And then when I got to NOAA, I started funding some of his work. I told you about $6 million a year, and NOAA funded him. So my joke is that uh, he was my hero when I was a midshipman, but when I went to NOAA, I became his $6 million man. <laughs> if any of your listeners know what that show is, it's a 70s show, basically called the bionic man i think yeah. you know that yeah inflation did a the heck of a number to that that price tag <laughs> exactly right <laughs> Good can't point. get much for six million dollars on the bionic man anymore that's funny yeah, you can maybe get an iphone that's yeah. about it <laughs> um so yeah let's let's talk about that w- let's describe your experiences at NOAA. you had you held a pretty senior leadership position there you you were engaged in that organization for a while let's just talk very briefly about about um, your experiences there sure sure so i was the acting administrator of NOAA. And that also serves as an assistant secretary and acting undersecretary uh, of the commerce. So uh, that so just below a cabinet level position. So it's pretty high up. And then, uh, and then I was permanently assigned as the deputy. So I was double hatted. But anyways, uh, leading the agency, I really enjoyed it because it was a lot like I did in the Navy: meteorology, oceanography, hydrography, and uh, and uh, but not just supporting naval operations. I was really supporting the entire country and uh, all our U.S. territories and states, and uh, it was a really fulfilling mission. But uh, one of, as we talked about earlier, one of the initiatives I put forward was to develop a national strategy and plan to map, explore, and characterize the U.S. exclusive economic zone. So basically, you know, our ocean backyard, mm-hmm. and that's a, it's a big area. It's the second largest of any country, and it's kind of debatable depending on what you may include as the territories of France, because France has the largest possibly. But either way, we have a lot of ocean territory that's not been mapped or explored. And so we led that initiative. We kind of likened it to the Lewis and Clark expedition. There's a, a new underwater Lewis and Clark expedition, mm. and they're still carrying it out. So we finished that strategy and plan, and now, now NOAA is still executing it with other agencies and, and groups like the Navy, like NASA. NASA actually has some research going on because in the ocean because they, uh, the moons of um, Saturn and Jupiter, Enceladus and mm-hmm. Europa, I believe, have, they think they have oceans under their ice crust. And so to just explore those eventually, NASA is fine tuning its uh, capabilities in our own oceans. Yeah, very good. I was going to suggest, I imagine NASA would like to leverage the type of research you're doing in the underwater environment to aid their, their work going to Mars and going to the moon. So. Exactly. Yeah, they are. Very cool. Um, all right. I uh, will maybe just kind of bring up a little bit of our coincidence in the Navy. So um, maybe we can just kind of jump to that for a moment. Let's do we that. can circle back to. But um, there was a time when I was operating off of the USS Theodore Roosevelt uh, in the 2015 time frame, uh, and we were um, executing part of our workup cycle. Um, and people now know of this flight and this incident due to the video that has been released, um, the gimbal video and the go fast video. Right. People may not know that you were, I'll just loosely say, involved in, in the response to that incident to some degree. Is that correct? And can you tell us about it? It is. It's correct. And I can tell you about it. First off, let, let's let our audience know that you are a naval aviator who la- landed and recovered, <laughs> launched and recovered off aircraft carriers. One of my job was to drive an aircraft carrier. I was a deck watch officer on the Kitty Hawk. And every time one of you guys took off from the bow, you know, I always kind of clenched my teeth, hoping <laughs> nothing would go wrong. And uh, so g- just God bless you for your courage and service. Thank you. I think that's amazing. And uh, so, yes, uh, while you were flying off the USS Theodore Roosevelt, I was commanding all the Navy meteorology and oceanography um, forces in the Navy, a small group that were deployed all around the world, many of them on aircraft carriers to do flight weather. It's an incredibly important thing. And, you know, every time an aviator in the military goes flying, any time, you know, a ship's looking at what they need to do the next day in order to keep themselves in the box or or on their route, I mean, it it all boils down to weather. Everything in the ocean uh, is affected by weather. And when you're out there, you're subject to the effects of those weather. So it's incredibly important. Um, 
it's not something that I would have had to deal with you personally, but the, the effects of the information, the people, I had to deal with those people every single day, and they were some of the most professional people that we dealt with on the ship. Yeah, thanks for that. I, they're aerographers' mates is what they're called, and, and I, I was proud of what they did and, uh, and do now. And yeah, as we're recording, Hurricane uh, Idalia is making landfall uh, near Tampa, and all the Navy ships in Florida sortie to get out of the way, obviously, mm -hmm. so that's an extreme example. But yeah, so I was in charge of this, this group of people out deployed on Navy ships and working at weather forecast centers and shoreside. And, and in my home, I had two jobs. One was in the Pentagon, and I, and I rotated between my other job, which was in Mississippi, at Stennis Space Center. Mm -hmm. and, and when I was there, while you were operating, I had sailors, aerographers on that carrier and the other forces supporting all that was going on during that exercise. And, uh, and, and on the Navy secret internet, I received an email one day, and it was from the United States Fleet Forces um, operations officer. And I reported to him regularly. Who is that in the scheme of what we're talking yeah, about that's here? That's a good point. So US Fleet Forces is a command in Norfolk that oversees uh, aircraft carrier strike groups, um, expeditionary units, even submarine forces. Uh, so it's a four-star command in charge, of, in charge of largely all the operational units in the U.S. before they deploy. And so they, they're in charge of the training, that workup exercise. Yep. And so, uh, and now I reported to him as a support command. So I did weather and oceanography. There were other people who reported to him that were commanders of strike groups or commanders of other shore commands. Mm -hmm. And this email went to all of us, all these admirals, one, two-star, and senior executive service civilians. How, how, how often does that happen in your experience? Well, th th this type, uh, never. <laughs> in fact, normally, uh, from an operational uh, commander, rarely did you get these blanket emails. I mean, they're much more efficient in their communications at, at that level. Mm -hmm. um, There's usually a process that surrounds the information that they're getting at that level. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you're, you're, if you're working on a specific issue, you'll get, uh, you'll get something from the small group or the parts of that staff that mm -hmm. are working it but for that kind of blanket email to go out was unusual and especially it was on the secret internet and or secret network pardon me and uh and the title of it, the email was urgent safety of flight issue and i'll never forget it it's sort of seared into my memory and and attached was what you referred to the the go fast video mm -hmm. and the 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 operations officer said to us in the text if any of you know what this is, tell me ASAP. We're, we're having, <laughs> what you were doing, experiencing, uh, numerous near midair collisions, and we're gonna have to shut down the exercise if this keeps going on. And obviously, my, you know, my understanding, I, I, I work with intelligence community programs. I immediately knew, okay, well first, that's probably referring to, he thinks that one of us might be working on some IC project mm -hmm. and, uh, and have, hasn't shared with the, uh, the staff what's happening. At one and two, though I knew immediately also that is not ours. It's not our technology. We don't uh, do things like that in training ranges. We have we we have um, test ranges to do those kind of things with advanced technology demonstrations, and uh, and of course the behavior of you you've, you've articulated in other shows that uh, it's nothing like our technology can do mm -hmm. uh, for that one video and the others. And so I just kind of concluded immediately. Okay, that is not ours. Something else is out there. At, that I had considered previously, and now I basically saw proof. And but even more crazy is that the next day, that email was wiped from my computer, and everybody who received it, it just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And and the, the thing that shocked me the most is this, and that's why I'm committed to supporting you in that in ASA, is that uh, I was the chief meteorologist of the Navy. My job was safety of flight, mm -hmm. and and so here we are. Uh, this we're having a major safety of flight concern with these UAP, and no one ever talked about it again during a meeting. I went to monthly meetings at Fleet Forces, the ops officer was there, the person who sent that email, the commander, and all the supporting commanders like me who were on that email. Hmm. Monthly meetings in person, I'd go down there, nobody ever talked about it. A and I, I, I couldn't believe it. Now, I moved on, but then, of course, after that, and I, I was still in government, couldn't say much about it, but after the leak of 2017, the New York Times, and your, uh, the progress that's been made with Galileo and ASA, I, I finally come out to share this story. 
That's fascinating. How, how do you how do you interpret that? You know, oh. do you interpret it as oh someone spoke up and said that's ours, and therefore we're just not going to talk about it again, or? Is that how that would be handled in your experience? Well, I'm only speculating because, again, no one talked to me about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, but what I what I believe, of course, and we've seen with the last UAP hearing, there obviously there was there are programs, special access programs that a limited number of people are read into. I have been read into programs like that where that governed the that kind of data data on UAPs that we can't explain, and obviously crash retrieval and, and et cetera. So there's, there are programs like that we're finding out. And interestingly, uh, just to follow- Do you have any personal experience with any of those programs? Not those. Mm -hmm. I, I have access, I've had access to programs that we don't talk about, mm -hmm. that we can't, that, that, and the thing about that- Normal saps. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unacknowledged programs, mm -hmm. if you will, not acknowledged to the public or even to sometimes uh, partners. And uh, uh, the thing about that though, this is, this is really what, I keyed into with the UAP hearing is uh, I've seen this culture with career uh, IC professionals that uh, think that their program is so need to know that people like leadership, admirals, generals, senior people that rotate in and out didn't need to know about them. I, I've been shut out of programs where I thought, hey, wait, I'm in charge of sailors using this stuff or executing or collecting that information mm -hmm. or what have you. And I'm not, you're not reading me into that? No, no, sir, it's only so many people can have that. Mm. And that, that bothers me, because when you're accountable, and I was accountable, mm -hmm. uh, you should then have that information to make the best decisions. Absolutely. So that, that's a problem, and, and, it, and it goes on up now to Congress, and that's what's happened, is they've realized they can't exercise oversight without this information that's being withheld from them. To your point, no one ever talked to us about it again either, right? So, right. Uh, and we were the ones that actually had to mitigate that safety issue for ourselves because we were out there flying and you know having to build out procedures about staying. So away think from about that. what you're just saying mm -hmm. now, okay? So you you left the Navy as a lieutenant, correct? Okay, I, I left the Navy as a one star, in charge of a lot of people and programs, and and it, it kills me that you had to go do the mitigation. You didn't have leaders stepping up for you. I mean, and now granted they were probably bound by these classification issues, but that's wrong. I mean, when they, for a leader not to be able to, and just like I spoke about, not to be able to go and look after their people and ensure they're safe and put in the things in place, make the reports, do the investigation, that's wrong. And that's why what you're doing is right. Well, thank you for saying that, Tim. But, you know, I'd say part of the process that I didn't, or the problem that I identified was that there really was no person that was ultimately responsible because this information either went into the safety bucket or it went into the we don't care and it's no one's responsibility. So although we did communicate it up, it would get to a level where it was just um, overcome by the um, urgency of the other more practical military matters that people at that level need to deal with. Well, this is true. Uh, it's, it's, that's a funny thing because on the one hand, we're talking about off-world non-human intelligence activity, which is really the, the story of the 21st century. There's nothing bigger. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, and this is so ironic, and I've been there, you know, naval officer, naval commanders are just dealing with the brass tacks and getting you know, their forces ready to deploy and there's a million things to do, administrative and operational and technical. And it's just so busy it, when you're a, a, an operator in the fl Navy mm -hmm. that it just, it's overcome by events. And so I, I get that. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're interested probably and they really want to look out for you, but I got to do all these other things. Yeah, yep. it's, that's, I get that too. Uh, certainly part of the problem, you know, and this is the bureauc bureaucracy that we deal with and the Navy and other, um, agencies within the government have had issues like this. The Navy has had issues with um, sexual assault in the past, and they've put a lot of effort and time into uh, increasing the communication, the reporting on that in order to accept responsibility and move on from the conversation yeah. and, and improve it. Um, I feel like we're somewhat in that situation now where we're in a position where people are still uncomfortable talking about it. There's still, yeah. um, you know, the potential safety risk that can be posed. And at the end of the day, if we're not able to execute our training, if we're not able to use our working areas, we're working at a deficit, and that's going to hurt right. us over time. It's something we need to resolve immediately. Yeah, um, I how, agree. how do we resolve this, Tim? I guess to that point, you know, in your mind, what is the practical steps that we, as a, as a general public, or perhaps as institutions within government, can do to move this conversation forward? Is it about 
communicating more clearly? Is it about discovering more data through ingenuity? Is it through, you know, conglomerating financial resources to make investments in this? Is it political action? What is it? Is it all of those things? It's all of the above, for sure. <laughs> and, uh, but yes, and so I, just kind of to start with, uh, there's a lot occurring now, which is good. For example, uh, the, so the DOD has this Aero office. So mm -hmm. they are charged with the scientific study of these f phenomena. The NASA has a study team, and, and that, that's happening. You have universities like Stanford with Gary Nolan's lab and Galileo Project at Harvard or Avi Loeb. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you have a lot happening already, but it was with the safety issue and getting the government, the, the agencies that have oversight of this and, man, and management responsibility, uh, yeah, more, more has to be done. And, and the way that works, though, it has to be legislation, it has to be Congress, because they're the ones that execute or, or draft and, and then pass the laws that govern the executive branch. Mm -hmm. And so you really can't, add, it, now the executive branch could step up and decide on their own to you know, direct policy to be more transparent and disclose and, and, and implement um, procedures to mitigate the safety concerns, et cetera, but they haven't. Uh, and I don't want to sit there and get political, but, but that's the way things work. Mm -hmm. and, and what happened is, and the UAP hearing was interesting to me because you had uh, basically uh, the witnesses, you and your, your teammates, David and Dave, uh, go out and make the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, the Director of National Intelligence, and the National Security Council all look real bad. That, that's just it. So, and I've been, you know, as a, as a former political appointee, I know exactly how this works. Uh, you know, I had my charter, and if the Secretary of Commerce or the White House did not want me to say something, I, you know, I was pretty limited on what i do. Thankfully, the things I was doing, ocean-related uh, mostly and some weather-related work, uh, was fairly apolitical, and I didn't get suppressed. But, but what's happening now is they do not want to disclose. So that's, you know, everybody blasts Sean Kirkpatrick for his response to the hearing, but he is bound by what the NS, the White House, and what the, the EOD and DNI want to have done and, sa and said. Mm -hmm. And obviously, they don't, want to they don't want anything to be done or said. Interesting. Yeah. How do so, we, so part just to tie a thread, that's why we really need this disclosure legislation mm -hmm. that Schumer has introduced. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that legislation here in a little bit. But first, let's let's suggest. Okay, they you know, uh, if those those uh, stakeholders that you just said don't want to further engage the conversation, I don't know how they can necessarily stand on that leg when they've admitted that this is truly an aviation safety issue. That's one message that they've been very consistent on, and. I believe that means they have a responsibility now to share that information with the commercial markets and to be able to bring that reporting structure onto that side so that the same lessons learned can be brought over to that industry. Um, what are your thoughts on what the commercial pilots have been seeing and the lack of resources for reporting they have? Well, well same. And, and more needs to be done. More needs to be um, – um, uh, we need to allow them to, to make those reports and encourage that like you've been promoting. It's interesting um, because I think your article in Politico, that was a great article, though. And Thank you. It, and that's the point. We do have a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and so th this, is, this should all, again, if FAA is not going to do anything, uh, then, then, uh, then we, we have to get Congress involved. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, that's what has to happen. But, uh, but I'm encouraged because there is already movement. Like I mentioned, NASA. And, and even though people are very frustrated, certainly if you go on UFO Twitter, you'll see it with Arrow's work and lack of transparency, but, but at least we have these things in place. Congress passed the laws to put them there, and, and so that's a start. And we, and we can start with that. We, you know, it's not that the government now is, uh, that, that first thing of breaking the ice on, on the stigma, uh, ha I think has occurred already. I, I personally was excited because my good friend and colleague, oceanographer Dr. Paula Bontempi, uh, of the, the dean of the Graduate School of Oceanography at Ro University of Rhode Island is on the, UA, the NASA UAP study team. So that, that's a start, you know, and she's, she's been speaking a little bit about that. But so, so we have, we have, we, we have made some progress, but much more needs to be done. Very good. When we had the email reports and you learned about the objects that we were seeing and the safety issue was occurring, was that your first experience with UAPs? Is that what brought you into this conversation? Well, yes, uh, for the most part, but, but I had always been interest, uh, interested in, just because I'm in 
inquisitive and uh, in the topic. Uh, you're not as old as I am, but there was the show in the 70s called In Search Of, and they tackled these topics like UFOs, and my wife and I would joke about that because it was interesting. What, what, what if? Um, but it really happened, accelerated for me personally. When I was, had this job, I was the superintendent of the U.S. Naval Observatory, mm. a really neat and unique command that's been around for the most part since 1830. And, and the purpose of the command is to collect catalogs of star positions and their brightnesses, as well as recording precise time, which all originated during the age of sail when the primary means of navigation was celestial. And, and the means for timekeeping was also watching the sun and the moon and, and that. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that the modern version of the observatory now is making very precise measurements of stars uh, and their brightnesses for satellite navigation and calibration of uh, intelligence uh, satellite uh, instruments. How fascinating that the same same observatory can provide a useful function, you know, way back in the 1830s that's militarily relevant, and today. yet today it's still military relevant in a different domain. Right. Same I, facility. I, I love this command because it did. It had all its origins way back in the founding of the country. During We were making a really kind of a scientific renaissance in that, in that time period after the 1800s, and so there were some really notable people that were associated with it, like Albert Michelson, who uh, won the first uh, Nobel Prize in Physics for measuring the speed of light, mm. and, and others. And uh, yeah, so I was really a proud legacy to be a part of that. Um, but the modern version now, which is collecting star positions, it, th they employ a number of astrophysicists, and uh, and I got to learn a lot about astrophysics and uh, and cosmology, mm. and and I I thought all the time about this, uh, how big the universe is. This. This galaxy we're in, the Milky Way, has between 100 and 400 billion stars. Not all, not all are known yet. You know, we, haven't, we haven't necessarily discovered every one. And, uh, and we're in an observable universe of over 100 billion galaxies. And we've seen this with the Hubble images. Think about that. It's hard to. Yeah. yeah. And, and so just to, that job made me appreciate that we just cannot be alone. It'd be arrogant to think we are. And, and so that, that was sort of the seeds, uh, working at the Naval Observatory, for my being really open to the UAP uh, video when I saw it on at, at that point, when you were in that, in that position, what was your, if you recall, if you had an opinion on um, the Fermi Paradox at that point, where were they at, in your mind? Oh, I, I, yeah, it's funny. I, if, um, Avi Loeb likes to talk about that, and he makes fun of that, that where are all they? <laughs> you just have to look. And by the way, you can't really, when you look at how big the universe is, um, and he, he articulates this really well you know, from a probability standpoint, it, it's not likely that there just be, well, who's to say? But, but the, they, we don't have to necessarily be stumbling over uh, them all the time for them to exist, mm -hmm. right? And, and so um, to me, and, but also we're finding, I think, that um, we are starting to see evidence. Uh, you, you did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, th that's how I address that. Very cool. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit, you know, we were talking a little bit before this, this seems like a topic that you want to continue to engage in. You seem pretty passionate about this now. Um, how are you looking to kind of mix your passion of the underwater environment and above, of course, um, with this topic? How do you see yourself playing a role um, as an oceanographer and a perhaps UAP researcher? Right, forward? right. Well, thanks. Yes. Uh, well, first off, the why is because we are encountering, uh, again, off-world, non-human uh, entities, and s however they're able to be here, whatever they're operating, vehicles or what, and, and that is just the story of the 21st century. And this is changing everything. We're at an inflection point in our understanding of our place in the universe, and 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 the understanding of the physics and technology around that. That's it's just mind blowing. I, think about what can happen because of this. We are could learn new ways of meeting the challenges of our, of our planet, mm -hmm. food insecurity, climate change, our own, our own understanding of, of our social science and the way we, way we you know, think if there's more than us, we may be hopefully behaving better <laughs> towards uh, each other on the international stage if we find these things out. You know, some people might make the argument that if we were to receive a lot of advanced technology, it would be harmful because it seems our society lags behind 
in the maturity from the technology we're exposed to in some sense. We don't mature to a level of societal development and mm -hmm. then we bring our tools with us because we're mature enough. We find ourselves with tools that we're perhaps not well equipped to handle. Um, Oppenheimer. Yeah, exactly. Um, do we do we think that, you know, we perhaps, maybe the learning that needs to occur isn't technological, maybe it's societal. Perhaps there's some other learning that we need to advance in a way that is outside of our current expectations. Do Absolutely, yes. Uh, yeah, and there's, it's interesting because there's, um, I'm, I'm working with groups of people that aren't just engineers and scientists. They include social scientists mm -hmm. and anthropologists uh, and, and um, it, it, behind the scenes on this UAP issue. So you spot on, absolutely right. Uh, but, but to go ahead and take your question about where do I want to bring my uh, oceanographic expertise. So uh, because I have that, I have years of experience in that field, it, it just makes sense for me to look at it from that angle and focus on that uh, maritime undersea domain. Because we know these objects from multiple reports have exhibited transmedium uh, movement and, and, and I'm, I've received reports from people and of, of occurrences undersea, so you can call them undersea UAP or what have you, and, uh, or USOs, that's the term of art. I think people use a lot too, un unidentified submerged objects. Mm -hmm. And so we, there's not much out there. And, and what I am proposing to do because of my position on two uh, uh, notable ocean-related uh, bodies is that uh, is to increase the scientific study of them. And so, for example, uh, for one, I am a member of the Nas Ocean Studies Board, pardon me, and it's within the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And so that, that's just a big group that does, is authoritative with experts and they perform all sorts of studies. And, um, and, I, and what's interesting is I actually, I did go to them. Uh, I'm on this board, I recommended for their study program this year to do a survey of all the government and academic data sets that are available to see if there's evidence of anomalous phenomena in our seas. And interestingly, the, the board did not laugh me out of the room. They, they said, this is a good idea, this is compelling. I, I, I presented about what DOD is doing with Aero, what NASA is doing with their study team, and they said, okay, well, but you know what you should do? They said, they said you should go to this other group at the academies called the Naval Studies Board because they're going to allow you to look at classified data too. And, uh, and I said, great. Uh, and, and I've briefed the Naval Studies Board many times in the past as the oceanographer okay. of the Navy. So uh, this is kind of like going to home, back home, you know. I'd, and I went to the board and they are chair, it's chaired by my former boss in the Pentagon, for, retired four-star Admiral Gary Ruffhead, who was the chief mm -hmm. of naval operations. And, uh, and I, so I knew him. And I went to him and I gave him that exact pitch. So let's do a survey of all the data sets within the, the Naval Oceanographic Office, the Office of Naval Intelligence, and then my old agency, NOAA, and see if we could find evidence and maybe prefer locations or characteristics of UAP under sea, like Arrow is starting to do right now with UAP in the atmosphere. And he said we should do it. Hmm. Yes, and interestingly, and uh, now he was he had kind of two angles. He thought. Well, sure. If something's in our uh, in our water space, we should know what it is. Uh, and he also said, well, and also if we do that kind of survey, we're going to get a better understanding of where our gaps in oceanographic intelligence are because right now uh, China is outpacing us pretty quickly or poised to, and we don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, now my next task is to go and get funding I, uh, that that we need government agencies to support the study of uh, the survey. And, uh, and it'll be those groups I mentioned, the Naval Oceanographic Office, Office of Naval Intelligence, and NOAA, and I have to go to them and see if they're willing to support a study. Hmm. Uh, I'm, uh, I haven't reached out yet because I'm waiting for a little more, um, I'm looking for more, some more data, and I'm, I'm gradually accumulating that right now. Got it. Um, one other thing, so I just got named to be a member of this body called the Ocean Research Advisory Panel, and it is a group of advisors the, uh, for the, a White House body called the Ocean Policy Committee, which I worked with in the past. If you recall earlier in the podcast, I mentioned about this national strategy to map and explore the USEEZ. That was the group I proposed that strategy and plan to and who approved it. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're the authoritative White House group on ocean, everything ocean, and uh, for the most part, and so mostly science. And so uh, my goal is to, at one point, advise, recommend to them 
that undersea UAP became a national ocean research priority. Oh wow! Yeah, and so that that if that happens, and normally you uh, every year the White House puts out a, a R, an R and D priorities memo, and uh, and if that if 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 that gets in the R and D priorities memo, that means government agencies, O and I, NAVO, NOAA, all need to ensure their next year's budget has money to do those kind of things. Fantastic. Yeah. So I know. I, Long story short, I know how the government works, especially on ocean things, and I'm trying to use my knowledge and network and authority to pursue the scientific study of these phenomena. Awesome. Well, I support you in that effort. That's fantastic. Where was that? Where would that data go? Would it just end? Would it end up at Arrow? And I know there's some legislation we can talk about in a moment that might exist kind of beyond Arrow as far as that information flow goes out towards the public, and we can talk about what that looks like. Um, but in what you just described. Some of that data would be classified, of course. Is there any way that any of that uh, data or analysis would be available for um, the general scientific community? Uh, possibly. It depends where the data originated. If it's a classified data set, that might be difficult. Uh, of course, th so there's that. And then th yeah, there's a couple threads here that are not really tied together yet because Arrow does have an undersea domain part of its charter. But I I've talked to them, and they basically said, until now at least, uh, we don't have enough funding to do all that, so we're just going to focus on the atmosphere. So you don't expect, yeah, so that's not a domain that they're actively um, gathering information from, best of your knowledge. Yeah, not not, not as a, my last communication with them last year, uh, but uh, I know Gillibrand has called for full funding of Aero, and, but I don't know what full funding means mm -hmm. necessarily, uh, but ultimately, it, 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 if that the undersea pursuits I'm, I'm, I'm executing here get rolled up under arrow um that might be the case i, I don't know how this is going to play out necessarily mm -hmm. but at the same but but, the, but but at the same time by the way so arrow might have that charter but you still it's going to have to work with all the groups i mentioned navo o and i noaa if they if they're really going to pursue the undersea piece and and they just might need a little help mm -hmm. and so i think I, I we can do that for them um yeah so we'll see and ultimately it's very interesting to see then now with uh schumer's amendment that or legislation that uh, there, he's this, this UAV records review board, I think is mm -hmm. what it's called. They're ultimately going to make the call on these kinds of things about what gets shared to the public. So, um, yeah, we'll, we're, we're going to see about that. Yeah. Um, the, the legislation uh, Tim here is referencing is the uh, UAP Disclosure Act of 2023, which is currently attached to the 2024 uh, NDAA. Right. So this legislation will, will uh, create the assumption of, or create the assumption of disclosure for um, data sets related to UAP, and this board will essentially make a national security um, um, analysis on that data, and then we'll either allow it to continue to the public or potentially retain it for national security reasons. Right. Let's talk about the hearing. You you were there at the hearing. You sat um, just to my back right, uh, yeah. I believe. Thank um, you. Courtesy of you. I appreciate the front <laughs> row seat. It was Yeah, it was my pleasure and honor to have you sitting behind me and showing your support for this topic. Um, let's talk about that. How, how was that experience for you? Well, it was uh, historic, as has been reported, and certainly for me, fulfilling as I've relayed my interest and now to be associated with you and be your champion. On one level, uh, my, my perspective during that, here you were, here, here was retired commander David Fravor, uh, major retired uh, David Grush, and you, former lieutenant. And a lot of my perspective on this is why are you not getting flag and general officers retired like me behind you? I, I just I feel like I've talked about previously about leaders needing to step up and, and be champions uh, for pe their people. And, and that's kind of the sense of duty, I feel, for you and the people that were at the hearing is you, you, don't, you need someone that has, I guess, maybe the experience and the, not that I'm great, okay, but it helps to have former flag officers <laughs> on great your camp. side. Okay, so sure. Thank you, thank you. But, you know, I just thought people need, uh, someone like me should step up and, and you. back you up. Because it, it has. I, I've gone places, and just because of w what my experience is, they've said that things are, are changing. And... Um, I'm glad for that, but I, I really just do it as a sense of duty for folks like you. You know, uh, changing as I, how? Huh? Changing how? Well, I, as we're seeing, we got Congress interested. Mm -hmm. We have all sort. Like at the operational level, yeah. though, do you do you see that change happening at the level that you're interfacing and have these conversations with? Perhaps uh, people still in or at that more kind of organizational operational level where they're 
turn a sausage, right? Or is it more of the, like you said, changes happening in Congress and I think everywhere. Yeah, I, I we you and I have been and and with other uh, uh, folks I work with, uh, it's incredible how many people are coming out, aviators, military personnel, with with their experiences, and and, and these are real credible people. Heck, uh, I was just not really well. Yeah, I just in, in rank and file. I was fishing in the Florida Keys, mm. and I might have shared this with you, but. Uh, I, I, I go out my day, my day, you know, in any given activity, and I don't intend to necessarily talk about UAP, but it comes up sometimes. <laughs> and sure enough, my fishing guy was very interested. He asked me if I knew anything about this hearing, and <laughs> I was there. And, uh, and long, long story short, there is a guide he fishes with uh, who's seen UAP in the Keys 25 to 30 times. Wow. We're talking very large disc object that is the size of a Boeing jet airplane hmm. and he's seen this many times one time it showed up over his house a and this guy is a salt of the earth very credible observer uh, when you fish in the keys it's often by sight and he's a really he's a really skilled people and he has no agenda no. He, he's he's this is, he knows what he saw though wow. and it's, it's interesting so this is sort of coming up a lot now and I think the more people that speak out the more acceptable it's going to be the mm -hmm. more the stigma gets removed and, uh, and, and the more we can learn about these. Do you think some of the more outspoken critics of this conversation, um, how do you think that they are, do you think they're keeping up with the data flow now? Do you think they're keeping up with the conversation or do you mm. think that they made a decision at a certain point in this conversation and are sticking to that? Yeah, this is funny because uh, there's a thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Have you heard of it? I have. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, it's something. Let's explain it, though. Yeah. It's something about the fact that um, individuals who don't know a lot about a certain topic tend to be the ones that will say the most about it, uh, where the experts are probably more cautious because they know how much there is still to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that's very apparent in the UAP critic arena uh, to me. And I, I have to laugh sometimes because you'll get these people, and I don't want to name names, but uh, th they'll make they'll make these, uh, s they'll suggest certain things about the witnesses and whatnot, and uh, assuming they know how the government programs work, et cetera, et cetera, none of them have been in government. A lot of assumptions in there. A lot of assumptions. And they, they just, and they'll, they'll say things about, again, s special access programs, about the way the IC works possibly, about the way the military works and the government works, and they don't have a clue. They, here, I had 36 years in the government. I have a little bit of an idea and they're making statements that are just categorically uh, false. Mm. And I, so I have, a, I have a problem with some of those. That, that, uh, not that um, it is good to be critical, and, I, and one of the things I do appreciate is many people are saying after that hearing, okay, just show me the data. Show me a craft, show me a photograph that's from you know, an authoritative source, well, that, roger that. And that's what this review board is going to do at some point. It's gotta take some time, but uh, but I get that. I get that people want to suspend maybe a conclusion until they see hard data, mm -hmm. and that, that is totally legitimate. I, I don't argue that at all. Mm -hmm. what, what was your reaction to the hearing sitting there? Did you, you know, it, it's a few weeks later now. Gosh, how long has it been? Almost five weeks, a couple months now. July, right? Gosh, July. Yeah, yeah. We're in September now, goodness. Um, well, well, you know, I think everyone kind of viewed that hearing as pretty um, – I'll use the word momentous. You know, it was certainly a unique experience. The um, uh, the representatives were very engaged in a bipartisan manner. There was, you know, no joking. There's very little partisanship. Um, they were kind of bouncing off each other's questions. They seemed earnestly interested in it. Now here we are, almost you know, two months later. What can we look forward to as far as the outcome from that hearing? What what do we think is going to happen? What are we afraid might not happen? Yeah, this is interesting, Ryan. Uh, so first off. In the moment at the hearing, there were some parts to it that were really noteworthy to me. Uh, I really, all the witnesses, you, Dave, David, were great. Uh, liked uh, Fravor. <clears throat> he was, he was, uh, he, he obviously reluctant to be there, but he saw what he saw. Valuable, important observations. Glad he contributed, of course. And uh, I mean, he'd been on 60 Minutes. Uh, gosh. So. Um, but then there was a very interesting part, there, and I'm kind of going to go back and forth in terms of pros and cons, positives, not so much. Uh, so one thing I really liked, and I, I'm, I'll just say when a congressman gets 
talked about trying to go to, I think, Eglin Air Force Base to see some information and talk to people. And this one-star Air Force general said he couldn't go. I, I, I was shocked. I mean, you don't sit there and do that. You don't tell members of Congress. So a uh, big mistake. And I liked what he said. He said, once we sat down and had a discussion about how authorities flow in this nation. <laughs> I just love that's a great way of phrasing it. That's right. <laughs> and uh, and that's right. And so oversight committee, et cetera. Now granted, there are special access programs that follow rules and et cetera. So there's there's gotta be a process followed, et cetera. But but that's our you know, Congress has the authority and and so that's important. And I think uh, what's been hid from the Congress is now creating a problem. Uh, I like that. Another part of it, though, is interesting. I have a really good friend, a former naval aviator, who is in uh, Congressman Burchett's district. And he called me up right afterwards. And, uh, and his problem wasn't necessarily getting UAP disclosure. It was the fact that that was a House hearing where the House is run by one party that's very antagonistic against the current administration. Uh, everything they were complaining about was basically administration policy, you know, mm -hmm. DOD, IC on disclosure. And, uh, and so it was, there was a partisan undertone that uh, risks uh, more progress, possibly. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that was it. They, granted, it was a bipartisan body of, of, of congressmen, but the nature of it, uh, you know, House, the House right now is pretty aggressive towards the, the, the current administration, a Democratic administration. So there you have that tension. And that could be a problem. And that's why I think going forward, it's just really essential. I don't know if the House is going to get any more traction on this. You've heard different reports. It really is the Senate, which is now run by the different party, but now, but but there's a bipartisan interest, thankfully. And and recall, a Democratic-led Senate going to have more more luck, I guess, if you will, uh, or likelihood of getting a a bill signed by the president, you know, in a Democratic administration. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's really kind of where we are. The hearing was amazing, and it was just wonderful to be a part of it. And thank you again for for the the seat. <laughs> but. Uh, but yeah, and interesting, and, and and the reporting from it since has also been, been fascinating. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about what happened in the House and what's been happening now in the Senate, and how that seems to be flowing temporarily. Can I pause you one? Yeah. Minute? So, um, th I think you were on this, but member Ben Hansen's been linking us up, mm -hmm. and there was this one guy, Jeff Edwards, A6 pilot. Yep. Um, I also I want to ask you about this, and if we want to talk about it or not, but. Um, I didn't tell you when I went fishing, mm -hmm. and I can repeat this if you want. Um, the, uh, the fishing We're recording, so. okay. So fishing guides uh, in the Keys, they have some high-end cli clientele, mm -hmm. and, and my one guide, for example, Gordon Ramsay, he filmed a show with, oh, cool. uh, um, Huey Lewis went fishing with him several times, and uh, and 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 a Navy captain, aviator, who was in charge of the squadron in Fort Worth that does is op four. Do you know what the name of that squadron is? Uh, no. Okay, but it's it, that's what they do. They do the op four in different exercises. Got it. And his name is op force. Yeah, yeah, yeah opposing force. Yep. Now I could tell you his name later, if you, but I don't want to give it out now. But he is. Uh, he was talking to my guide about UAP, uh, and they had a discussion, and he was referring to you, mm -hmm. and so you might know him. He he he. So here, at random, right? He's fishing in the keys with my. He friend. would be. <laughs> uh, like, uh, don't know. I want to though. Yeah. And uh, and here they have start talking, and he's saying he's, he's talking about you and the hearing, and he's saying he's been flying out in Whiskey Seventy Two and seeing these things all the time, and they're causing major safety issues. So he was just basically echoing what mm -hmm. you've been. And he here he's a captain, and he's wondering if he should stay in because he's just not sure that he he could he can continue to support the um, ignoring such important mm. issues. Wow. Yeah. So he, he's actually making that as part of his consideration to stay in or Yes, uh, that, that, as, as he relayed through this fishing guide. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Interesting story, thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, it's always super um, super helpful, I guess you could say for me, um, to, to hear that people are finding what I'm doing of value to them as they're operating. Like that is the best compliment I can receive that what I'm doing has some small effect on their ability to operate. Like, so for me, that's like the best compliment I can receive. So yeah. thanks for sharing that story. I, I, so just to give you a little bit of validation or confirmation, same, same. Uh, I have to say that uh, as having led at many levels, there's nothing more rewarding than when someone comes back to me at some point and says, you know, you said this once and I remembered it 
and I, I followed it and some good happened. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing better than when you know you influence someone in a positive way like that. Awesome, very cool. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I enjoy being a fellow at the Explorers Club. Uh, I've done one expedition for them and it was uh, kind of related. It was an oceanographic expedition where we were photo identifying great white sharks off Guadalupe Island in Mexico. As one does. Uh, yes, exactly, <laughs> in steel cages. Very and cool. we did that for three days, or five days actually. And uh, it was very exciting. I thought, oh yeah, you know, after a day of just seeing the same old sharks, it's gonna get boring. No, no way. The, the <laughs> adrenaline rush that bungee jumpers feel or whatever, that's exactly how it was every day getting in there. But, um, <clears throat> but a another friend of mine who's an Explorers Club member who's really notable, his name is Victor Vescovo. And Victor, has done the Explorers Club Grand Slam, where you climb all the peak, highest peaks in the seven continents, and you ski to the North Pole and the South Pole. Wow. He's done that. So, but Victor, that's not enough. And by the way, he, he's a retired uh, Naval Intelligence officer, cool. uh, and then became a, a private equity investor. And, uh, and now what he did after that, and how I got to know him when I was at NOAA, was he built, he, he decided he didn't want to do more, and he learned that the deepest trenches in the world's oceans have not been explored. The deepest one, Challenger Deep, has been um, dived to twice, and that's it. And these other ones had never been um, had never been seen, basically. Huh. And so he built a submersible, and this is really kind of in contrast to the Ocean Gate Titan submersible tragedy. Mm -hmm. This is how to do it. That was how not to do it. Victor built a submersible that was fully rated to the, the maximum depth of the ocean and more, had it tested, pressurized, certified, and, and then he went exploring. And he dove in all the trenches. He went down to Challenger Deep 15 times. Wow. Yeah, this is 35,000 feet. This is, we are seven miles. This is incredible. And uh, and really admire him. He found the deepest shipwrecks in the world, two of them, and he did all this great exploring. And the way I got to know him is we had a White House summit on ocean science and technology partnerships, and we invited him to speak. And he told us, hey, look, I've done my, my dives in all the deepest trenches, but I want to do more. And I'm collecting all this pristine multi-beam bathymetry data of uncharted areas of the ocean. And I'm willing to share that with you. And so we, he and I signed an agreement, and he did that. He went and explored the, the Aleutian Trench. He went to other places, and, uh, and he shared the data with us. And we put some scientists on a ship, and it was great. So he had, he had a ship and a submersible that launched from it and untethered. Really neat, extreme engineering. So, what the point I'm getting at is this. So, he has one of the most, you know, premier ocean sensing systems on the planet. Mm. And uh, we were chatting one day, and he said uh, online, and he said basically, "Hey, I'm uh, taking my ship out off SoCal, and I'm going to do a, a test out of the new sonar." Um, I, was, I said, "Really?" And knowing all the UAP activity out there, I work with some friends and uh, and the Galileo project. And we put together some coordinates of places where we saw UAP activity was known to occur. And, and even some where we saw some transmedium activity on US, USS Omaha, for example. Mm, yep. This is all around Catalina, all around where the Nimitz occurred. So I gave him a bunch of coordinates and I said, if you happen to have time, go check these out and see if you can find any evidence underwater of disturbances by the, by the UAPs mm. if they go underwater or in transmedium or, or even undersea infrastructure mm -hmm. why not you know, and yeah I, and i i sent it out to him and of course i didn't know his cut on this very you know esteemed explorer and uh and an intelligence officer formerly so i thought he's either gonna ignore this entirely or maybe he'll bite yeah and he just said send me the coordinates <laughs> and, <laughs> he was in and yeah exactly and this is what's really interesting okay now again uh, we're just exploring we're looking at the seabed and um and he did that. And, and I asked him to go to one feature, which is really unusual that we'd seen in earlier data sets, where there was a ledge a uh, few miles, uh, maybe a couple dozen miles off San Pedro, that has a section of it, an undersea ledge, that's just completely carved out and horizontally displaced two kilometers. Hmm. Now, normally, when you have uh, things like this on the seabed, they're called turbidity flows, and they're basically just sort of like landslides. And if you've ever seen a, an avalanche, possibly, where it just sort of slides down the hill at a slope, mm -hmm. that, that's what occurs in turbidity flows under the, on the seabed. This thing doesn't look anything like it. It looks like something just fully was carved out. And I, I can't, I still can't, and I've asked, I've asked geologists and others, explain the mechanism for how that occurred. How big is it? 
Well, it's about a, it's over 100 meters tall and it's displaced two kilometers wow. from the ledge, mm -hmm. and uh, which is a significant distance. And you and you we have a very high definition uh, bathymetry map map of it, and you can see it sort of scouring from it, from all the way two kilometers. And so uh, um, I have that. I, it, the data was processed and analyzed by my good colleague at the University of New Hampshire, who's the foremost authority on ocean mapping, hmm. very close to here. Uh, and and so Dr. Larry Mayer, and he looked at it for me, and he said, "I'm not sure what that is, Tim." So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my next step is to find a, a science institution to dive on that feature and where it came from uh, with an ROV and s see what it is. Mm. is, is it, can it be explained by natural undersea marine geological processes or not? And uh, it's pretty interesting. I've actually been, I've been approached by a producer. And I don't know what's going to happen, but the producer is considering, and I don't know, my good friend Bob Ballard and his ship with an ROV contracting him out to go look at it and bring me on board. And I've sailed on a ship before, by the way, and it's <laughs> great. So that, and he was considering um, at working with Dr. Paula Bontempi on the, on the NASA UAP team, because she's an oceanographer at URI, where, where Bob is affiliated right now too. So this, this could be awesome. if we're able to actually go forward and they agree. I, I have no idea what Paula and Bob are, have, have said on this right now, but the makings of a really epic undersea UAP show, if you will, uh, expedition, mm -hmm. uh, are in the works. Very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. That's very exciting. If you could, I mean, that sounds like a very interesting um, feature that's underwater there. Um, my first thought was that perhaps it's something similar to what's known as the Bimini Road over in the yeah. Bahamas area, where it's man-made, appears to be man-made structures yeah. that are now underwater due to rising sea levels. This feature sounds too large and too far to be part something, anything like that. Uh, at least, you know, human-made is the assumption. Um, if you could, you know, send a research team to really any feature like that, where else in the world would you go? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, and I, I don't know right now. I have not looked at enough. Uh, well, I have looked at a fair amount, actually, of undersea features, and none of them kind of call out to me like this one. Mm -hmm. However, there is one. Okay. And, and this is very interesting, too. So my old office, uh, NOAA, and its subordinate office I mentioned earlier, the Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, that has the ship Okeanos Explorer, dives uh, and explores with an ROV, partners with Bob Ballard, pays him some money, et cetera. Well, that office was exploring in, uh, in the Pacific a year or two ago. I don't remember exactly when. And it came across a very interesting feature. And it, a New York Times article was just published about it, about uh, it, what you, there's a series of small little holes mm. that almost look like they're man-made, and, and they're, it's very linear, and each one doesn't look natural, really. It looks- I've seen a picture. Yes, right? exactly. You can probably find it and put it up. Yeah. Right, that, well, that, that, that uh, uh, I, I think I was at NOAA when they, found, they came upon that and took the video. And I only wish on board they they dug into it. They have they have equipment. They have mechanical arms that mm. can look under the you know under the the seabed, and I wish they did, but they didn't. They just recorded the video and moved on and kind of raised a question mark. Was that on a fault line at all? That was my first thought. It almost looked like perhaps there was some kind of void under there and the the sand was right. going well, in. No, that, that, I don't know if it's a fault line, but fault line features are much larger. Yeah, this looked like. Some mechanical thing, right? Do you see? It was. It? I, it was hard to really get too much context because it's just a picture on the yeah. water, so it's hard to say how big it was when I when I saw it myself. But we'll put it up so people can can judge themselves. But it did look artificial. Well, it did. It looked artificial. And the interesting thing about that is, so I have seen hours of video of the seabed taken by that ROV and and live and and post processed. Nothing. I mean, natural seabed topology, whether it be deep coral or geological features, et cetera, volcanic, I've seen it all. Okay. That, that is, I've never seen anything like that. Interesting. I know. And so that, that's another one to go back and look at. Very cool. Thank you. The more you delve into UAP, it becomes clear that there's one element, which is just craft, you know, crashed craft possibly and retrieval programs. Nuts and bolts, if you will. Yeah, nuts and bolts. And then, and then, well, and, and they're potentially biological controllers that are non-human. Um, and then there's another aspect that is 
uh, involved uh, relating to people's perception and consciousness. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, that gets really interesting and very uh, diverse in terms of sets of experiences. And, uh, and so there, you, 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 you've talked to Gary Nolan, I think, and others too. And we, we previously mentioned social science and that aspect of this. So there's, there is, there's that element of the phenomena. Mm-hmm. And, and recall uh, uh, that fisherman where this is, this is something that happens quite a bit that I've, I've learned about that once not everybody, but once someone has an, uh, an experience, then they then they end up having repeat experiences because mm-hmm. as if what they saw connected with them, mm-hmm. which is interesting. And when you look into the quantum mechanics, that's explainable in terms of an observer forcing an outcome. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there are people studying this. And I have some people in. There's a a, a group at University of Virginia, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, mm-hmm. that does this kind of study of consciousness. And uh, and there's there's really sound sound science behind it, and it's it's a shame too many people think that's fringe. And, and we're actually mm-hmm. really talking about the existence of consciousness after death. So how does that relate to then the phenomena? I don't know, mm. but there are people studying it at, with with really credible arguments and data, which is so that that's there's a linkage there that I don't fully understand. I definitely don't, but I but I, I know it is being looked at by many. Very interesting. You know, we're, we're at an interesting point in our technological evolution where we're starting to engineer intelligence, if you will, mm-hmm. machine oh, yeah. intelligence. And I think our ability to understand fundamentally what intelligence is, we can define it, sure, but to, to then create it and, and understand what that intelligence can do if it's perhaps equal or greater than us is a slightly different conversation than saying we've now met something that's sentient or is conscious. Um, and the consciousness conversation has kind of always been on the other side of the intelligence conversation. We're having that intelligence conversation a bit more now. Does our advances in machine learning right now and our ability to further understand intelligence, do you think that's a pathway to us further understanding this more subjective science, this, this consciousness, which by definition is just our subjective experience of the world more or less? Yeah, I'm not sure, Ryan. That's a, that's a great question. And, and the future of AI and that is a... Uh, uh, is moving so fast right now, so it's, it's really hard to say. But but I think I've I've also studied this a bit. And by the way, I, I did a AI based machine learning based master's thesis in 1990, mm, so it's wow. it's not that new. Mm-hmm. It's just the computational power has just really mm-hmm. exploded, right? Basically, so and that's helped some acceleration in the field. However, I I do I think there's a boundary. I don't think that all of a sudden, uh, well I hope not <laughs> that. Uh, um, that Terminator is going to be you know, actually realized, that, that mm-hmm. scenario. Uh, but ultimately, um, the, what, what I've thought about, and again, there, we, we have people involved now in the UAP discussion, as I mentioned, people who are studying consciousness, people who, people who are studying religious studies. And, uh, and they, uh, they're thinking about this aspect deeply. And I think it goes beyond AI and you know, that. I think this is something altogether different. Mm-hmm. And, and if you, for those who do study this, uh, it's fair there if people know that um, there's there is a we have a higher level of awareness than most we, we think uh, other living things but other living things do have that if you have a dog or you see marine mammals whales they are they are self-aware they're very intelligent they have a spirit for lack of a better mm. word and it seems that we've kind of evolved a little higher but there's a spectrum if you will mm. we'll go extrapolate that to us evolved in a million years, or whatever these intelligences are, which are obviously more involved than us. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, have, they have technology that's way beyond what we have. So what happens to human consciousness if it evolves a million years or whatever we're seeing, and, or, or these things? Maybe that's it. That maybe we're seeing an element of, just like us in our consciousness, but just evolved that much more. What does that look like? I, yeah, exactly. Well, it's the things, some of the things we're seeing about how a lot of observations of these UAP again, and you, you might go see this. Um, then they attach to people. Mm-hmm. You've heard this. You've, I've heard. Yeah, yeah, you've heard this. So it's a, uh, yeah, that's a whole area of, of I'm very interested in. Don't know a lot about. So I, I've been enjoying contributing where I can in this whole field. And again, I, my first step into it was to join uh, Avi Loeb as a research affiliate for the Galileo Project. And I don't do a whole lot, but I was pretty proud to have contributed to his recent expedition off Papua New Guinea to recover the remains 
the fragments of the first observed interstellar meteor. Mm. And a really interesting story with that in terms of its features and characteristics were unlike any other meteor that's been observed. It basically burned up real late, so it was made mm. of some super strong material compared to other meteorites. And, um, and using techniques, interestingly, I, I was able to help him because NOAA performed a very similar expedition in 2018 off the Olympic coast of, the, of, the U of Washington. Similar in what, what, what way? A, a meteorite had struck the, the, the ocean and the fragments sank down. Mm -hmm. And with the help of a NASA scientist on, on board NOAA's ship, actually it was Bob Ballard's ship, the, the, the Nautilus, uh, funded by NOAA, mm -hmm. they recovered the fragments of this meteorite using a magnetic sled. Mm -hmm. So we took that playbook and I shared it with Avi and, and he built a team to do the same thing off Papua New Guinea in a much more challenging situation. We're talking almost two kilometers depth. The, the, the meteorite off the, the west coast in 2018 was only about 300 meters depth. Mm. So this was a tough one. Oh. And, uh, but he put, he put together a crack team of folks with Navy and salvage experience. And, um, and I, I wasn't able to go out with him, but I worked with NOAA scientists to determine the exact profile of atmospheric winds on that day and so we could categorize better, model the drift. Once the, once the meteorite burned in, um, some of the, the light fragments kept on going and were dispersed by the winds while the heavier ones just sort of sank right down, mm. just fell right down. And then I also did uh, oceanographic analyses to figure out what the currents were. So I, I, I worked with three NOAA scientists to determine those atmospheric and oceanic current and wind profiles so that we could model basically where that debris field was exactly. And they used that to plan the expedition, and it was a success. Yeah, it looks like it was. Yeah. I, I know Avi and the Gallo team has uh, recently announced um, or is planning to announce some of their findings. So I know I'm looking forward to well, more details on it. They yeah. did. It was just yesterday. Yeah. And he submitted the paper, and he's convinced that this is of extrasolar origin. So he believes he has the particles from this meteor. Uh, me right and uh, and that's real so he's scientifically looked at the composition and it's uh, it's it's really interesting so, so the papers out in the in it, the wild in a preprint he's got a he's got a, a, a an article in medium about it but I don't think the paper has been accepted yet okay. it's been submitted yeah okay. yeah and in fact uh, there he has posted the, um, the the submission you can look at the submission again not peer-reviewed yet but uh, Avi does pretty well he doesn't put it forward anything that's not fully baked no, oh, certainly. Yeah. yeah, I was looking forward to being able to share it uh, yeah. on this episode. Do that, do that. It's, it's exciting. Just yesterday, I read about it, and then um, the other uh, effort I'm involved with uh, just recently. So Gary Nolan, who was on your show, he's starting something called the Soul Foundation, S O L, and he's asked me to be on his advisory board, and I'm glad to say yes. And he's got a uh, a, 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 a anthropologist named Peter Scafish as his teammate, starting this whole effort. And, and they're looking hard at the, I guess, the public policy dimensions of, of UAP, which I think is great because uh, there's the science piece that Avi's doing and that I want to do with the undersea aspect. But then really w one of the things I, I've kind of really thought deeply about is that here we are. We could potentially have, uh, again, visitors that we have no policy about how to ad address, uh, and, and we should. <laughs> this, yeah. is, this is changing the whole paradigm uh, of our civilization. So we should have some public policy development. Should talk about going. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and the only way we can really develop public policy is to ensure we disclose some of this information to the public. So Gary and Peter are, and they're thinking about really interesting things, not just the whole technology, but again, the, what are the impacts on society? And, um, and, and here are some of the ways they've been thinking about it, which I think is great. This could be like 9-11 on steroids, okay? Getting contacted by visitors with technologies way beyond our means, and we don't know their intentions, and are, are we just waiting for the shoe to fall? What is, what's going on? So this, is, this is really something to look at. And gosh, there's a million movies about this. Arrival, War of the Worlds, you know. There's just, so we should really think about this deliberately mm -hmm. and not just let Hollywood do it for us. Yeah, it's irresponsible not to. Even if you assume that the, the probability of it, if you're a skeptic, you would still want your government to be in a position of preparedness for this first um, not preparedness just because you think it's something that uh, you, don't, you haven't accepted that worldview, essentially. Yeah, right on. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well said. 
So there, there's that effort, which I'm excited about. Um, working with you, Americans for Safe Aerospace, big champion for that. And uh, I, I'm really, I, I don't know if I told you, my dad was a naval aviator too, mm -hmm. and I flew in A3s. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, Sky Warriors, uh, back in the day. And so uh, I just I have a big piece of my heart is with naval aviation. So uh, really glad that you're supporting aviation at large and that, and this and safety for, for that. Awesome. Well, we're super happy to have you on the team, Tim. I'm proud to have you uh, as part of this conversation. I'm super excited to see what you're able to accomplish um, in the underwater space and, and perhaps above. So thank you again. You're welcome. I'm always here for you. Thanks, Tim.